Hello, meatbags. It's been a while. So while I was away, apparently gaming is now classified as a disorder by the World Health Organization. At the same time, trans people are now declassified as not mentally ill. So I can see what went wrong here because I'm guessing video games have been the center point of finger pointing since its creation from mass shootings to our children are becoming Nazis. However, even though we have data that proves the exact opposite, the media and politician will justify their claims for the greater good, as well as making trans people who have gender dysphoria a mental health disorder who may go to the doctors and have their genitals mutilated and take massive amount of hormones that will mentally and physically warp them. I'm out of my, out of my mind, out of my fucking mind. I'm, I'm out of my fucking mind, out of my fucking mind. My, 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 I'm out of my As completely mentally balanced individuals. Today, I have a video by AJ Plus here diving into the world of video game addiction. This is the same group who said video games are making our kids Nazis. And the following backlash to that was too great, and so they had to hide it away. Good job! So, as we all know, there is chemical addiction and mental addiction. As we all know, anything and everything can be addicting. Hell, we have a show called My Strange Addiction where there is a woman who is addicted to drinking her own urine. And I'm addicted to drinking my urine. But, however, in this video, it would seem they kind of hit some potholes here and there and are confusing or downright ignoring what people say in order to push the narrative forward. A lot of people watch TV all day. I'd rather play video games. I'd probably say at least 50 hours a week. I try to keep like a healthy balance. My bigger issue, just besides the time, was spending a lot of money, just spending and gambling in the games. So the first person said a very good point. Some people watch TV, others play video games. But this is brushed aside. The video kind of makes it out that anyone, anywhere that plays a video game more than, let's say, an hour is addicted to video games. Which is odd because I don't see any videos or articles from them saying that TV is bad. Then we have a man saying he pays a lot of money in terms of in-game purchases. Look, if you pay hundreds of dollars in the game for DLC or the infamous loot box system, this is not an addiction to video games. This is a cover-up gambling addiction. Confusing the two is what we got into this predicament. And everyone knows this so far to the point where the government is getting involved because the loot box system is so f***. And if the government is getting involved, you know we are all f***. We're doomed. Doomed. Do I'm Ahmed Chaboudin, and I've been looking into the dark side of tech, from facial recognition to fake news. Really, Queen? <laughs> no. The global market for games grew from $70 billion in 2012 to $122 billion in 2017. By comparison, global box office revenue for films in 2017 was $41 billion. This is the only thing I like about the video. You don't really see these kinds of videos stating the facts of how video games are beating out movies and cinema, even doubling the net growth in under five years. This is why most people on the far left are trying to encroach into the gaming territory. They want this money machine. They want a big old chunk of the pie. They don't want a piece, they want a chunk. A big, fat, moist chunk of it. And as we can see in the comic book industry, it's a deadly virus that will leach every bit of coin until there is nothing left. This is why loot boxes are a big problem in the gaming industry. People will pay these because it's gambling. Even though most people are just blaming the games, it's developers like EA that push these things. Hell, Activision stated last year they broke record numbers but fired 800 people. Or how Black Ops 4 made $500 million in three days, but EA states it was a complete flop because they didn't have five million more dollars. You what? Gaming has gotten so big that watching others play attracts massive crowds. And two thirds of American households now play video games, according to the Entertainment Software Association. 
It brings in large crowds because some people are rather quite skilled in particular games like League of Legends and mostly towards arcade fighting types. But if we labeled video games as an addiction, stating that two-thirds of the American household have these addicting machines, this would be a pandemic addiction more than alcohol and smoking combined. This is why the claim of gaming as a disorder is asinine while transgenderism is not. Do you play a lot of games still? Uh, yes, not as much as I used to. Why? Time. Yeah. <laughs> but how, how much would you when you were playing a lot of games? Like, uh, I mean, I would say like 30 hours a week at most, but that's it. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Why is that pump not a those lot? Numbers yeah, those numbers up. Those are rookie numbers. <laughs> why do you play still? Yeah, for sure. How? Probably say at least. 50 hours a week. Wow. Pretty much all my free time. All your free time? Yeah. Does it ever, I mean, is it tough? Do you ever, like, lose track of time? Some games can definitely kind of let you lose, make you lose track of time more than others. Um, but it's definitely harder to balance kind of work life, personal life, and video games. I kind of cut out the personal life part, focused more on the video games currently. <laughs> <laughs> so here we have the yin and the yang. Someone who wants to use their time for other things and has more personal control, and the person who loses track of time likely has his social life in the game itself. Talking to the crew, meeting up with regular strangers, making new friends, it's not as isolating as some people will think. But yes, you should every now and then go out and do something. I can lose track of time myself or just go outside and do other things. The man might have some social difficulties in public that are not like a convention because you really don't have to talk to people unless they are a seller. Like I know when to step away because like I understand like some games like you know they'll make me like really upset. It's like okay I need to step away do something else. Ding ding ding. What do we have for her, Johnny? So we have the prime example of the regular player that the vast majority of players are. The video itself wants to go out of its way to make it seem like gaming companies are making their profits from these addictive games and the real life consequences of them. But it's a bit hollow when you go further into the video lumping almost all of the gaming public who really don't have a problem into this small pool of gambling addicts. One study estimated that 9% of teen gamers are addicted. With an estimated 2.6 billion people playing video games globally, it's not a limited issue. So, you have to think on this. If 9% of teen gamers who are half of the gaming population, it doesn't even come close to an estimate of 1 out of 10. This would be a significant amount of addicts. So that 9% of half of the 2 billion people playing video games are addicts, this is a pale in comparison to 12.7% of American adults who are alcoholics. But the biggest question that the video doesn't really address is what is an addiction to video games? So how many hours do you must play in order to be an addict? Three, five, seven, nine hours? Because to me this video and the article stating how the gaming is becoming a disorder is next to gambling addiction, which again is the main confusion from these people. You spent eight weeks here. Yeah. I was playing on average between like 12 to 16 hours a day. So I would just be, I would either be playing video games, watching porn, watching some show, or I would be sleeping. That was it. So if someone who's not a streamer or a let's player, I guess you could say 16 hours is pretty bad with the remaining eight hours either or most likely working or so he probably just gets off of work and plays video games, he could be a part-time worker. But he really can't be saying he's an addict if he factors in other things, like, for instance, watching porn, watching some video show, or sleeping. So, why is he in rehab for gaming addiction if most of his time wasn't on video gaming itself? It would seem to me he's just a regular shut-in Taking a look into the rehab itself on the site, they describe a shut-in pretty accurately. Someone who really doesn't feel like they have nothing better to do or people to hang out with outside of the gaming group they usually go with. 
my main excuse of rationalizing was like, I'm only playing so much just because I'm, because I'm depressed. And that's why, like, if I wasn't depressed, I wouldn't be playing. Do you think games are designed to be addictive? Yeah. Oh, come on! And what is the basis of this outcome? Because it seems more like you played video games because you were depressed. Seems more like it has nothing to do with an addiction and more something that stands outwards to some other mental health disorders and not a gaming addiction. Hillary Cash founded Restart after seeing patterns related to gaming and screen addiction. My first case was in um, 1994 and, you know, throughout the 90s, you know, people were coming in uh, for therapy. And parents are handing their devices to their kids and it's going to really impact their development and, and prime them for addiction. Even if they're not addicted, they're going to be primed for it. Are you high or just incredibly stupid? No, that sounds more like an adult not wanting to be a parent, so they stuck a Game Boy in their child's face or shoved some pills down their throat so they don't have to hear their child. It has nothing to do with addiction. It's more of a lazy parent being a fucking lazy parent. Again, it all comes back to the parent did nothing wrong and it's all the video game's fault. Do you feel anxious, shaky? Very much so. There, there's very, very real physical withdrawal symptoms to video gaming. How serious a problem is this? I was so depressed that I started researching how to kill myself on my phone because I couldn't get up and go to the computer to do so. Okay, so again, this seems more like this has to do with more of a mental health problem than a gaming addiction. I haven't had a physical withdrawal before, but I've never played some Dark Souls, stopped to go get something, and then had a f***ing convulsion on the floor because I didn't have the controller in my hand. He's looking up how to kill himself on his phone because of his addiction, right? I had a bad day. I think I'm going to kill myself. You don't have depression or some anxiety. No, it's the goddamn video game's fault. Even though you were too fat and lazy to get up to go to the computer, so I'm sitting here wondering how the hell you developed a gaming addiction in the first place. There are concerns about the effect of games on kids, since nearly half of gamers are under 18 and mostly male. And teens who spend five hours a day gaming are 71% more likely to be at risk for suicide than those who spend less than one. Okay, so again, it's the video game's fault. These kids are moping in their rooms, playing video games, nothing else is affecting them. The video again doesn't state what's the borderline cause of the addiction, but there seems to be a big old pattern to me. Seems like it's just shut-ins who may or may not have depression, anxiety, or is antisocial. The rehab does nothing more but make them go outside in the fucking sun because mommy didn't tell them their hour is up. Saying that video games are the sole root cause of the addiction and not looking closer into it is lazy and a scapegoat for being either a bad parent or excusing your behavior. I don't play games at all. Um, if it's digital and gaming, I don't touch it. Um, so I don't even allow myself like Sudoku on my phone. Maybe I can force myself to never drink again. No! No? Dad, you like to drink, so have a drink once in a while. Have two. If you devote your whole life to completely avoiding something you like, then that thing still controls your life and, and you've never learned any discipline at all. But maybe I'm just the kind of person who needs to have it all or nothing. Nah, all or nothing is easy. But learning to drink a little bit, responsibly, that's a discipline. Discipline come from within. So the gaming industry went to what's called free to play, which basically you get the game and you can play the game. That's Bill Grosso, a gaming industry insider who founded Scientific Revenue to help companies maximize payments within their games. If you think about what a really bad game is, it's like the game that is completely non-addictive. Designing a good game is inherently trying to design something that people want, will want to come back to, will feel compelled to come back to. Apparently, the insider of the video game industry states that most video games went free to play. That's why you can pick up Call of Duty for free. No, it's just mostly mobile games and not consoles and PC gaming. Okay. 
I also like the lie of a bad game is non-addicting, as if the sole source of the addiction is the video game, when free-to-play games has the biggest gambling problem next to loot boxes. A good game doesn't have to be addicting to be fine, that's just a big old straw man you made up for this video. Dark Souls is one of my favorite video games. Every so often I'll go back on there and do a few runs, and then I'm off. Free to play systems are a gambling machine. The game is somewhat good, but can be better if you want a better game, might as well pay to get ahead. South Park did a really good episode of free to play games. I recommend you watch it. By 2016, Grand Theft Auto V had sold more than 60 million copies, but the free version, GTA Online, made more than $500 million on in-game microtransactions. You! You liar! Oh yeah. Oh yeah, that's completely true. There's a free GTA V. I would love to pick up a copy of a free GTA V. Did you say free? I think you said free. Get on with it! This is a complete lie or a monumental f up on their part because you need the original GTA 5 in order to get the online experience and again microtransactions can be led to more of a gambling addiction than anything else I mean holy shit. does anyone on your staff play video games how about you ask the so-called addicts not going over the footage and making sure it's you spew is right? Okay, I'm on board with that. My bigger issue, just besides the time, mm -hmm. was spending a lot of money just spending and gambling in the games. Mm -hmm. I will joke about it in the games. Like, oh, really? Like, oh yeah, I just spent $600. Yeah, they're getting their money there, ripping us off. But we would we would joke about how they, they've designed the games to get you to play longer, get you to spend more money. Again, this seems more like it's a gambling addiction rather than a damn video game addiction. It is your fault for spending that much fucking money on a game that only cost 60 bucks. That is your fucking fault. I think loot boxes are straight up gambling. Um, it's something that keeps people coming back, keeps people grinding in the game, playing it longer and longer, and because you can't just buy what it is you want, you have to keep forking money over. Yeah, no shit, honey! Last year, one game company caught so much flack for the practice that they've advertised a game this year with a simple message. No loot boxes. Yes, loot boxes are designed to be gambling magnets. I completely agree that the system itself is predatory. However, comma, you can't sit there and say that that all video games have loot boxes. This video doesn't even state that most games don't have loot boxes. Funny enough, the game you said had a free version, GTA 5 has no loot box system. You can put $100,000 into the system and possibly never get anything you want. It's a damn slot machine. You're the old woman at the nickel slots, throwing her life savings away, and for what? The big old jackpot of a cool looking skin. So it'll be like 300, 400. And then it's like, okay, well, I'll keep going until I get it. And like, if I don't get it after a couple hundred dollars, then I, I would get like really depressed. And sometimes I would just keep going. Like I already spent 400, well, I'm just gonna spend until I, until I get it. You what? That is the textbook definition of a gambling addiction. This man, has a gambling addiction. It's not a video game addiction. It is a gambling addiction. So he's going to rehab for the wrong thing. You know what's gonna happen once he gets out? He's going to do the exact same thing before he went in. So he's gonna get on a video game and start slow. Maybe $5 down, maybe a dollar. Then it's gonna be $10, then $20. Then he's gonna pay $300. And what the hell? How about a thousand? And he has learned nothing because he was diagnosed the wrong thing. You have done nothing but target video games as the sole source of this addiction. But it is obvious that is not the case. It would seem that these people are antisocial with depression and with high gambling addictions. It has nothing to do with video games. 
Three out of four American children have access to a smartphone, and nearly half of American parents believe their kids are addicted to mobile devices. Oh my God, be a f***ing parent, you c***s! Again, it's everyone but the parents' fault that their child is addicted to something. That their child is f***ed up at school. It is the video game's fault that they're antisocial. I work in a f***ing gaming place where I see countless parents, moms, dads, coming in with their own little 12, 6-year-old buying an M-rated game. And I'm going to have to f***ing sell it to them because they want their little man not to f***ing cry about it. Seems like nowadays parents don't want to take the f***ing responsibility of being a goddamn parent. Oh, my child is being so bad, it has to be that video game. My son has paid over $25,000 in microtransactions because I don't know how to be a f***ing parent and put a parental lock on my goddamn phone. It's never the child's fault, it's never their fault because it looks bad on the parent for being a terrible f up. So now we circle back how trans people are now not mentally unhealthy. Most transgenders have gender dysphoria, which is a mental health condition. But who cares about that? What about the massive suicide rates in transgender community, mostly due to regret of taking hormones and destroying their genitalia? There's no evidence by taking large amount of hormones can lead to chemical imbalancing, leading to depression and suicidal tendencies. Teenage transgenders have it worse though. More than half of the male teens stated they have attempted suicide, as well as 29.9% of female transgenders and 41.8% of non-binary say they have attempted suicide. As well, the horror stories of surgeries going terribly wrong, because this is a relatively new thing that most doctors can't really perform. Well, so here's Steve reading this horror story. Alright, I have no idea what the hell Tom is planning, but apparently he decided to lock the door on me. Oh hey, a new picture of the thing to read. Okay, let's start reading this, shall we? Oh, oh, yeah, right. Uh, hi, all. I'm writing this first and foremost to advise everyone to not choose Dr. Rumor. My, RS, my SRS experience has been for six months of pain, torture, and disappointment. My first surgery was in January. I chose Dr. Rumor. Okay, that, that doesn't sound very complicated. She was presented as the only option for my first by my insurance, Kaiser. I had wonderful experience with my entire care team. My therapist and psychologist during my evaluations. I trusted them. That was a huge mistake. Even if your care team is nice, do not trust your insurance company. They go to the lowest bidder and don't care what happens. I accepted because this was for my this is my only chance. Kaiser was the only insurance that covered SRS and GA. And I'm going to a field where it's possible I would never have 20k lying around to pay for the surgery myself. I thought my surgery was routine. No complications, Dr. Rumor was callous, but her interests were amazing. A couple weeks later, it became evident that something was very, very wrong. My urine stream had changed downwards. What? So I was spraying all over the toilet seat. What? And the worst part was, whenever I got aroused, I would swell up around the urethra. What the f***? And it would puff out. It seriously looked prolapsed. Autonomous, what have you done? My urethral area and pubic floor were outside of the lips. Additionally, I started losing depth despite dilating religiously. I had a dot and a half before my revision on purple. And half of a dot. Not even an inch on blue. Green was out of the question. What the f are they going on about these color schemes? I was devastated. I knew my body would take the surgery poorly. My wisdom teeth surgery put me down for two weeks, but this was the worst results I had ever seen for this surgery, so I scheduled a revision. My friend advised me to find a new surgeon, which I tried to do, but everyone I called had years-long or new waiting lists. Dr. Rumor had a cancellation and was available for 24th. I accepted because I wasn't going to sit around for a year with a broken foot. Shut up! 
There's a more depth, unable to have sex with anyone, getting pissed everywhere in the bathroom. The worst part about all this was that she blamed me for the problem. I don't like where this is going. Well, you played with yourself too early and you didn't stick to the relation skill. Okay. She didn't believe me when I said I dilated almost perfectly the schedule. I have no idea what this means. I missed my dilation six, maybe five times in six months. So I go back for my revision. Dr. Rumor was callous always when her doctor team works great. The surgery took all my strength. It was harder than the first surgery. So many hours spent crying in pain. Boy. My hotel room itching all over from the pain fears. Oh god! They told me I had a small rep to suck the pain! Fixed it, I know. I was hopeful. The night before I left, after my first dilation, I saw a little bit of brown stuff on my dilator. Um. Okay. So. She said, it's impossible to have a fistula this quickly after surgery. Continue as normal. I flew home the next day, and by the end of the flight, my depends was so was soaked with liquid. I verified when I got home that was indeed coming from my back. Oh, I, uh, I, I don't, I don't want to continue. Instead of going to someone who they can talk things out with, they may most likely just be gay. Nope, take a bunch of pills and lose the deal. That is clearly more level-headed than a gamer having fun with their pastime. <laughs> Out of a fake hands, vagina, what the f***, man?